Wednesday night, we're still praying. I just sense that my spirit is working. Yeah. Yeah. You can always tell when you go to prayer, you see prayer ruffles the devil's feathers more than anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. The devil doesn't care how much you study the Bible, how much you talk, he doesn't care at anything. He doesn't care how much money we give, doesn't care how much good we do, doesn't care. Really, doesn't. But when boy, when the body of Christ goes to prayer, he really cares about that. And I can always tell when, when it's doing something because rumblings start taking place. Negatives start taking place. Sarcasm starts taking place. Things get out of order. Things don't seem right. Think things are, think things, in, in, and it doesn't come from without. The president doesn't call us up and say, hey, y'all need to stop praying quite so much because you're really causing me a lot of problems. It's always in the church. It's always within the body of Christ. It's always within the body. Whether it's the local body, whether it's the national body, whether it's the, whether it's the world body of Christ. Whenever Christians really go to prayer, it ruffles the enemy's feathers. That's right. And that tells me that we're doing the right thing. You see, here's what the devil would do. The devil would bully you and I to get us to stop praying. The bully's no more than a, the devil's no more than a bully with a megaphone. And if it's one thing I've learned, there's only one way to defuse the devil with his bully megaphone, and that's to look him square in the face square down the barrel of that megaphone and pray in the spirit and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And you take power and authority and dominion over the forces of darkness. Now don't misunderstand me for one minute. I don't ever want to battle with the enemy. Never. The enemy's not my battle. God is my battle. But when you've been bullied, you've got to stand up and fight back. Somebody say amen. When you've been bullied, you've got to stand up and say, I take power and authority and dominion. Yes. And you're not bullying me to stop what I know is effective in the kingdom of God. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Right. Amen. Yes. And I'm in a secret place. The title of this message this morning is The Excitement of New. The excitement of newness. I'm going to be facetious just for the next few moments, but not really. Kind of like when I say don't take it personally, but take it personally. Well, I'm going to be facetious for just a few moments, but kind of not really. Because I have a point for it all. You see, I think people need to... Even God understood the excitement and the need for new. You know, get yourself something new. We all need something new from time to time. I bought some brand new dress shoes that I was going to wear to church this morning, but I put them on and I came in and they felt like sleds and they just didn't feel good. And I said, I didn't wear them. So I'm going to take them back to Nordstrom's and give them back to them and either get my money back or get another pair. But I said, you know what? No, no, I'm really excited about my own. You know how much these shoes cost? Guess how much these shoes cost? And these were made in Italy. So guess how much these shoes cost? Cost. Somebody take a guess, real quick. What do you think they cost? What do you think it costs, Charlie? $25. Oh, my word. How much do you think? $25. You think I'd wear a $25 pair of shoes? Represent God? $120. How much? $120. what? $120? $120. Dude, get another number. How much? <laughs> 300 bucks. These are 300 pair of shoes. Three, I would never wear the, I would never pay $300 for those two. And, and you're not up here preaching either. So. 300 bucks. About two of them, about 12 years ago. The brown pair I wear, 300 bucks. These black ones, 300 bucks. What's 300 plus 300? 600 bucks. What's my point? My point is, you know what? You all need something new from time to time. You see, because newness brings something exciting. 
I don't care whether you want to wear a pair of $25 shoes or whether you wear a $300 pair of dollar shoes. If they're brand new, that's exciting. In fact, the other day, the other day, Kay, Pastor Charlie was telling me, I was having a conversation with him, and this is what newness will do for you, you see. And Pastor Charlie was telling me, he was saying, you know what, Pastor, if my wife would just buy me a brand new tie, I wouldn't be so mean to her. And that's exactly what he said. Sounds like Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I'll wait, he wouldn't wear it. Why, why wouldn't you wear it? Why wouldn't you wear it? Why wouldn't you wear it? Because you don't want to seem conspicuous. Or like, oh, I'm, you know, I've got way too much money. I bought a $30 tie or a $300 pair of shoes. And I don't want somebody, you know, to think ill of me so we don't buy new things. And they just, they just become objects. That's okay. You know, I know my brother Butch. Brother Butch, if he had this one brand new tool, he does all of these projects. And Brother Butch has been wanting this one tool for a long, long time. And every time he's working on a project and he needs this one tool, he doesn't have any things. Well, that's okay. I'll just make do with these other two tools. And these other two tools become compensation for the thing that he really needs that would make it easier, better, and quicker, and last longer. But because he doesn't have it, he uses these other two tools to compensate and then he just says to himself, well, the next time I go to town, I'll buy the tool. And the next time he goes to town, he forgets to buy the tool. Well, let me tell you something. If Brother Butch ever got that tool, he'd be so excited about that tool that he would create a project to use the tool. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, I told Brother Chuck for years. I said, Brother Chuck, you've got to get some new golf balls. No, Pastor, these old ones will be okay. You know, I got, I'm not very good anyway, and I'll just use these old ones. And, and you know, and, and I said, Brother Chuck, let me see the ball you're using. And so he showed me the ball. And that's good, dude, really. So finally I got tired of trying to put him to shame because Chuck has no more shame. So I said, okay, then just go ahead and use the ball. And then I said this to him, then as long as you continue to use these old balls, you're going to get what you deserve. deserve. <laughs> so finally, a while back, I said, Chuck, there's some new golf balls. So Chuck got himself some new golf balls. And ever since Chuck got those new golf balls, he's played the best golf of his life. <laughs> true, story. Yeah, true story. It is true story. That's how it works. And you see, folks, even God, you see, even God knows the importance of new. You see, as Christian people, like I was talking about with Butch, we just compensate. Rather than spending the energy that it takes to be hungry and thirsty for God, rather than coming and praying and battling in the spirit world, Oh, we can do that at home. You know what? My Bible tells me that when two or three gather together, that the Lord is there amongst them. And if they'll agree upon any one thing, it shall be done unto them. And that is taking authority over the enemy. Yes. And that's what we're doing right now on Wednesday nights. I don't expect you to come and stay a whole hour, but come and spend for a few moments and be in the presence of other believers. And feel the anointing in the presence of God. You see, God understands new. He understands the need for new. Amen. And Christian people, we just, we just get used to compensating. And that compensation becomes just a status quo. And then we get involved in that status quo and then it's almost impossible to get out. And, and then when, the, when there comes a time where the pastor or the preacher or somebody or life circumstances or whatever brings disaster or shame upon us, we're unmovable because, because our ditch is so deep. Our status quo is so deep that there isn't anything that can bounce us out of that status quo and get us to a new place of hunger and thirst for the things of God. Somebody in this congregation needs to get it. That's not being mean or cruel. That's a blessing. In case you don't understand, that's a blessing. When I say somebody in this congregation needs to get it, I'm saying somebody needs an extra blessing of God. Right. And not chocolate cake. Yes, Jesus. Turn your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 8. 
And we're going to look at even God and He talks about the need for new. Hebrews chapter 8. Boy, I'm excited about this. I'm so excited about this. All right, you follow along as I read. This is Paul talking to the Hebrews, the Hebrew church. And you follow along as I read. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest. So he's, he's trying to enlighten Jesus Christ to the past and to the present, to the future, and so forth. <coughs> Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer these gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So this is the mount, mount Zion. Uh, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You see, if your initial Christian experience, if, if your status quo, if our status quo was, is, is good enough, then why are we here? Because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write within them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more? And in that he saith, a new covenant, a brand new covenant he hath made from the first old now which decayeth. You see that old covenant, it decayeth and it waxes old and it is ready now to vanish away. There is a need for a brand new move of God in the body of Christ. Say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Like I said in Sunday school, I can't wait for it to start in you. It's got to start in me. And oh my God, has it started in me. Like I said in Sunday school, folks, I don't need to go to Africa. I don't need to go around the world. I was talking to this pastor the other day, and this young preacher, 29-year-old preacher, he's going to go around the world someplace and spend thousands and thousands of dollars, and that's okay. It's sexy on his resume. It looks sexy on his resume, and that's awesome. God bless him. But let me tell you something. I don't need to go over there because I've already been to hell and back. I've already looked death into the straight into the eyeballs of death several times. I don't need to travel the world to say, I know what blackness looks like. I know what death looks like. I know what it feels like to be on death's door. And I also know what it feels like to be lifted up into the kingdom of kingdoms. I also know what it's like to be glorified in the presence of Almighty God. And I tell you what, I'm choosing in the presence of Almighty God that I am in hell deep. Amen. I've already been there. And I'm not being facetious. And I'm not being metaphorical. I'm being absolutely truthful. My wife and I, we sat in a meeting this last week. And they told us that may not work, you may die. I'll tell you something. Brent. My wife will be set financially for the rest of her life. And I'll be in glory and glory and rest. You just have to figure it out on your own. <laughs> Now turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel. Let me get ready to wrap this up. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel wrote this right around 540 B.C. Ezekiel was one of the final prophets before there was no more prophetic word to the children of Israel. In just a few moments before we close the service, Diane, I'm going to ask you to come up and anoint you with oil and pray over you that you'll be well tomorrow. Anybody else that needs to be healed, that you come up, anoint you with oil, that you'll be touched. And anybody that you want a brand new experience from God to come up, hallelujah. It may take a little longer than 12 noon, but I think we need to spend the time to say amen. Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That's what the Holy Spirit spoke to us this morning. He spoke to us this morning of the clean water. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. Let me tell you something. People need to be cleansed from their idols. Mm -hmm. Christian people need to be set free from their idols. We don't know that we have them, but we have them. And it's shameful. Like I said in Sunday school this morning, there is no more shame. People should be ashamed of themselves to think this way and to imagine those things and to behave like that. They should be ashamed of themselves. And now in the church, oh, preacher, you can't preach that. That might offend somebody. That might hurt somebody. That might warp their personality. They might leave the church. Then go. Then go. Go and be shamed. The problem is, is, is that the last 40, 50 years, shame has been extinguished from the psyche of the human psyche of all of mankind. Yeah. There is no more shame. And where there is no shame, there can be no conviction. Yeah. We need to be ashamed of ourselves to think this way. It doesn't mean we're bad people. It doesn't mean you're bad or even wrong. 
But it's this need you need to get it fixed. Amen. We'll cleanse you from your idols. I will cleanse you, verse 26, a new heart. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within them. You see, that comes from God. And folks, let me tell you what my prayer is. Because you're going to get everything that you deserve coming up in the future. As my prayer is this, God, I want a new heart. I want a new spirit, oh God. Let me tell you something, Diane's going to have surgery tomorrow. I've already had surgeries. I may have surgeries in the future, but let me tell you what I want most of all is heart surgery. I want heart surgery more than anything. And God says, if you'll ask anything of me, that means of him. That means of him. Folks, I'm here to tell you, and it's already taken place. The fact that I was set free Wednesday night going from the bathroom to right around where Brother Eric is sitting. Folks, I got a revelation from the bathroom. I've been trying to tell you while you go to the bathroom, pray. Because God will move upon you while you're pissing. I mean, while you're going to the bathroom. <laughs> while you're doing your business, God will move upon you. You think I'm kidding you? I come out of that bathroom and God was moving on me. And he gave me a revelation right there. And by the time I got there, I had a big smile on my face. And by the time I got down here, I was praying in the Holy Spirit because I was set free. I'm out of it. I'm out. Daryl Stavros is now out. Tell me where to go, what to do, and when to get there, and I'll do it. The rest, God, is up to you. It's in your hands. Here I go, set, go. Amen. Oh, I wish all of us Christian people could pray that way, Lord. You see, you see, folks, here's the message of the modern church today. God, give me glory as I pursue my dreams. As I pursue my dreams, God, give me glory. And I prayed and I said, Lord, you the heal the one I got. You give me bread brand new one or you take me home. Whatever brings you the most glory, do it. Anybody getting this? Yes. Amen. Whatever brings you the most glory, I'm good with. So now I'm out. Daryl Stavros is out, and God can have his way. I want a new heart. I want a new spirit. That's why we do what we do. It comes from God, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land, I'm getting ready to finish. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God and I will also save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the corn and it will increase it and lay no famine upon you. You see, that's prosperity in the Lord, folks. We don't need to chase our dreams. We just need to have God to have his way in our lives. When he gives us a new heart and a new spirit, we prosper in the things of God. Yes. I don't want to just be a Christian. I don't want to just be a pastor or a preacher. I want to prosper in the things of God. I want to know God. I want a new heart of God. I want to experience the presence and the anointing of Almighty God upon my life. As God anoints and as he breathes and as he pours his living water into me, then I'm able to pour that living water into you. Amen. And into you and into you and into you. Hallelujah. Oh, come and drink of the water. And lastly, verse 30. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. And what that says to me, no more looking back. Folks, I cannot tell you, we sing the course, freedom reigns in this place. And I cannot tell you how free I feel knowing that I no longer need to look back, but that I am called to look to do. No longer do I need to remember what God did. But now I am called to pursue what God wants to do. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And
And somebody needs to get it. Somebody needs to get it.